Hi, and welcome again to my series of videos for Physical Chemistry 2. In the last video, we learned about determinants and the mathematical rules that they follow. Today, I want to start to tell you about how determinants are used to solve calculations in quantum mechanics. But before we can do that, we have to talk a little more about the quantum numbers that electrons can have. We've already talked about three of them, n, l, and m. If you've forgotten what any of those mean, you might want to review videos 17 and 18, where we looked at them in detail. But if you think back to your general chemistry course, you might remember that there are actually four quantum numbers, so there's still one that we haven't talked about yet. The fourth quantum number is s, which is called the spin quantum number. Back in the 1920s, researchers studying atomic spectra noticed that atoms containing electrons with the same values of n, l, and m actually produced two lines in an atomic spectrum. This was actually hard to notice because the two lines are actually very close in energy. We can see the difference between electrons with the two different quantum numbers if we place a stream of electrons in a magnetic field. When we do that, the electrons will travel in two slightly different directions depending on the strength of the field. It turns out that the electrons behave like spinning tops that can spin in one of two different directions, and those two different spins give the electrons a slightly different energy. We give the quantum number describing the spin the symbol s, and s can be equal to either positive one-half or negative one-half. But wait, it's important not to be fooled by this nice simple picture. Remember, although we usually think of electrons as tiny spherical particles, it's always important to keep in mind that they're actually waves and are described by a wave equation called a wave function. But how can a wave have a spin? The answer is, it can. The property we call spin actually isn't like the spinning of a top. In fact, it isn't really spin at all. Calling it spin just makes it easier for us to visualize. What we're calling spin is actually a property that's unlike anything we can see in everyday life. Because electrons can't actually be seen, it isn't possible to get a good picture of what they're doing, so we really don't know what electron spin is really like. But this causes a problem for our calculations. For example, here is the wave function for a 1s electron, which we looked at in video 18. But this wave function is incomplete, and so are all the other hydrogen wave functions we looked at in that video. The thing that's missing is the electron spin. And unfortunately, because we can't see what spin actually is, we just don't have an equation for it. So we can't explicitly include it in our expression for the wave function. Instead, for the portion of the wave function that describes this spin, we use the symbol alpha or beta, depending on whether the value of s is negative or positive one-half. That gives us the complete wave function of the electron. But again, we don't know the mathematical function that alpha or beta represent, so we just have to leave them that way in the wave function. Again, the reason we call this property spin is because the electron behaves as though it were rotating around an axis, much like a spinning top or the rotation of the Earth around its axis. The result is that the electron has what's known as an intrinsic angular momentum, and that's what's represented by the quantum number s. In addition to intrinsic angular momentum, electrons also have what's called an orbital angular momentum, and that's what's represented by the quantum number l. Again, this is similar to the angular momentum of the Earth. The Earth has an orbital angular momentum resulting from its motion as it orbits the Sun. So, just as the Earth has both orbital and intrinsic angular momenta, so does an electron. But as we've seen, it's important to remember that because an electron behaves like a wave, these forms of angular momentum for an electron don't look like they do for two solid objects interacting with each other like the Earth and Sun. So, an electron has two types of momentum, the spin angular momentum and the orbital angular momentum, and these are given by the quantum numbers s and l.
When we add these, we get the total angular momentum of the electron, which is represented by the symbol j. For instance, suppose we have an electron in a dxz orbital. What values could we have for l, s, and j? Well, as you might remember from your general chemistry days, the value of l for a d orbital is 2. And that's true no matter which d orbital it is. Meanwhile, the value of s can be either negative 1 half or positive 1 half. That means the total angular momentum, j, could be 2 minus or plus 1 half. So it's either 3 halves or 5 halves. So how does this connect to determinants? Well, the American physicist John Slater pointed out that we can write the overall wave function of an atom like a determinant. For example, we could write the wave function for a helium atom this way. In the first row, we have the wave function for electron 1. It's a 1s electron, and this part of the wave function is the expression for a 1s electron that we saw in video 18. After that is this, which is the portion of the wave function that describes the spin. In this case, it's for an electron with spin negative 1 half, so the spin part of the wave function has the symbol alpha. However, there's an equal likelihood that the electron will have a spin beta. So we have a second entry in this row for that possibility. It's still a 1s electron, so this part of the wave function is the same. Meanwhile, in the second row, we have similar entries for the other electron in the helium atom. Altogether, that gives us a 2 by 2 determinant. Of course, writing the determinant this way takes up a lot of space, and it'll be even worse as the atoms get larger, so we usually don't write out the wave function in this much detail. Instead, we'd usually write the wave function this way. Here, the 1s tells us that the part of the wave function that describes everything but the spin is the same as a 1s electron, and the number in parentheses tells us the number of the electron it refers to. Meanwhile, before the determinant is the factor 1 over the square root of 2. This is a normalization constant. You might recall that every wave function must have an overall probability of 1 when measured over all possible states. And this constant ensures that the overprobability will be 1. So think about what this equation is telling us. The overall wave function is given by this determinant. If you watched video 19, you'll know that another way of expressing this determinant is like this. We've multiplied the two elements on this diagonal and then subtracted the product of the elements on this diagonal, all multiplied by the normalization constant. Keep in mind that everywhere we wrote 1s, it's actually this larger function. So, if we were to write this out and multiply the terms together, we'd have a fairly complicated equation. And as you know from the previous video, the equation would be much longer if the determinant has three or more rows and columns. And that's what happens when the atom has three or more electrons. So, in general, the determinant that describes the wave function of an atom looks like this. Each row represents a different electron, as represented by the number in parentheses in the elements for that row. Meanwhile, each column is a different orbital and spin the electrons could be in, starting with the lowest values for the quantum numbers n, l, and m, and s on the left. So, for example, the first two columns are for the 1s orbital. The next two are for the 2s orbital. And the next six would be for the three different 2p orbitals. Overall, if there are n electrons in the atom, then this determinant will have n rows and columns. So, for example, if we look at a gold atom, we can see that gold has 79 electrons. So we'd have a determinant with 79 rows and columns. Notice that there's also a normalization constant in front of the determinant, and it's just equal to 1 over the square root of n factorial. 
There's one more thing to notice about the way we use determinants to represent wave functions. Let's look at the one for helium again. As we saw earlier, there's a different column for each possible combination of the type of orbital and the spin. Now imagine what would happen if both electrons had the same spin instead of one having spin alpha and the other spin beta. In that case, the spin in the second column would be alpha, so our determinant would look like this. But wait, if you watched the previous video, you know that one of the properties of determinants is that if any two rows or columns of a determinant are identical, then the determinant equals zero. In this case, columns one and two are now identical, so the determinant would now equal zero. But that can't happen. When a wave function equals zero, that's telling us that there's a zero probability that this system can exist like this. So that means that two electrons in the same orbital of an atom can't have the same spin. So what does that mean for our atom? Well, in 1925, the Austrian physicist Wolfgang Pauli realized that this tells us that every orbital can only contain a maximum of two electrons, and these need to have the opposite spin. This is known as the Pauli exclusion principle, and we'll see soon that it's crucial to our understanding of the structure of an atom. We'll talk more about how everything we've learned so far affects the structure and properties of the elements in the next couple of videos. But that's enough new material for now. I hope you'll join me again next time, but until then, have a good week!